Hello, welcome to this lecture on frequency response functions of a multi-degree of freedom system. This lecture is part of the course Dynamics and Control of Mechanical Systems. If you are not familiar with the concept frequency response function, please watch the lecture on single degree of freedom systems first before you go ahead here. Let's start. As we did for the single degree of freedom case, we start with the ordinary differential equations of an undamped multi-degree of freedom system. Now we have a system of equations. Capital M is the mass matrix of, matrix of this system. Q double dot is the column of uh, generalized accelerations. Capital K is the stiffness matrix of this system. Q is the column of generalized coordinates and capital Q is the column of generalized forces. As we did before, we can take the Laplace transform of this expression, and then we find that capital M S squared plus capital K times Q hat of S is equal to uh, capital Q hat of S. And if we take the inverse of this to the other side, then we find that Q hat S is M S squared plus K inverse time capital Q hat S. And this term here is the transfer function matrix of the system, which we denote with a capital G. And they have the fact that we have these uh, lines underneath the letters means these are matrices and these matrices have size n times n where n is the numbers the number of degrees of freedom of the system now that we have found the transfer function matrix we can do the same we did before for single degree of freedom systems and work towards the frequency response function matrix by saying that we are interested in the steady state response of the system. So if we are interested in the steady state response of the system, then S is equal to J capital omega. And we find that the frequency response function matrix of the system is capital H of omega is equal to the inverse of k minus omega squared m. As you see, these, these two func function matrices, transfer function matrix, frequency response function matrix, are two different representations of the same system. The transfer function matrix is typically uh, used in uh, systems and control analysis and the frequency response function matrix representation is typically used for vibration analysis. And when we do vibration analysis, we don't derive the transfer function matrix first and then go to the frequency response function matrix, but we derive the frequency response function matrix directly from the ordinary differential equations. And that's what we are going to do now. So if we assume harmonic excitation, then for the generalized forces, we can do the same as we just did for the force. Uh, it's a cosinus type of function, and it is the real part of this q hat uh, e to the power of j omega t, etc. And if we have this excitation, then the response will have exactly the same form with a, another uh, phase shift. And this can also be written as the real part of q hat e to the power of j omega t with q hat uh, given here. So we substitute this in the equation of motion. And we find a relationship between the complex amplitude of the response and the complex amplitude of the excitation. And this... <laughs> you see it here, is the frequency response function matrix. This is a matrix. And this matrix will, of course, be uh, singular 
at the natural frequencies, so that means the response tends to infinity, exactly the same as for the single degree of freedom system. So let us look at this matrix with an example. And the example we will consider is this uh, Trudov system. You see we have two masses. Uh, mass 1 is connected to the fixed world with a spring K1 and max, mass 2 is connected to mass 1 with a spring K2. And uh, x1 and x2 are absolute coordinates. Uh, x2 is defined with respect to the fixed world. And then we can, in principle, we can have a force acting on uh, coordinate 1 and we can also have a force acting on coordinate 2. These are the matrices that correspond to this system. The uh, column of generalized coordinates in general will look like this. We can have a force 1 and we can have a force 2. And if we now consider the complex amplitude of these forces, so we go directly to harmonic excitation, then it will look like this. And the response then will be like this. So this x hat and x1 hat, x2 hat are the complex amplitudes of the response. And uh, this omega between brackets is to stress the fact that, the, that these quantities are frequency dependent. In this case, the frequency response function matrix is a 2 by 2 matrix. So the frequency response function matrix will always have the same size as number of degrees of freedom we have. And how, how does this uh, matrix uh, look like? Well, it will look like this. Eh? So I said it's two by two. So if we put x1, x2 here, it, it will be equal to the AH matrix times the forces. And it has four elements, H11, H12, H21, H22. And important about this matrix is that it is symmetric. So H21 and H12 are the same due to the reciprocity condition. So what are these uh, terms in the frequency response function matrix? If we consider the first column, then we see that H11 is the ratio of X1 to F1 when force 2 is 0. And for the H21 is the same thing, but it is the ratio between X2 and F1. So the first column, we can obtain it when we set force 2 to 0. In the same way, for the second column, we set force 1 to 0, and H12 is the ratio of X1 to F2, and H22 is the ratio of X2 to F2. And in this way, we can understand the whole matrix. But the next question is, how does this um, look like if we make plots? It looks like this. So let me uh, walk you through it. As you see, as I said, H21 and H12 are the same. This should always be the case. And then here we have H11 and here we have H22. And the next thing we do is try to understand what we see. So the first obvious thing to see that the uh, first peak here in both graphs, in fo all four graphs, corresponds to the first eigenfrequency of the system. And the response goes to infinity in principle and if we don't see it go to infinity in the plots it's because of the uh, delta f delta omega uh, we use to make the plots here the next peak is the second eigenfrequency of the system and this system has two degrees of freedom so we will find two eigenfrequencies the other interesting thing about these plots is that we see that close to zero we get a horizontal uh, line. And what is the height of this line? Well, when the frequency goes to zero, h tends to the inverse of k. And for this particular example, 
these are the values. So if we calculate the inverse of k, we find these values, and that is exactly what you see here when the frequency goes to zero. But what happens now if we remove the spring here? So we have a system now with a rigid body mode. The first eigenfrequency of the system is zero. So how do you think these plots will look like? Like this. Obviously, we just said at the eigenfrequencies of the system, the response goes to infinity. So in this case, because we have this eigenfrequency at omega is uh, zero, then the uh, stiffness uh, uh, matrix, eh? the, the determinant of the stiffness matrix is zero. So the inverse of the stiffness matrix um, that all the com elements, as you see there, tend to infinity. So when we have a rigid body mode, we will see uh, this behavior. As a uh, last detail regarding this, these plots I just showed you for the rigid body mode correspond to the situation with two absolute coordinates. X2 is defined as an absolute coordinate uh, with respect to a fixed world. My question to you is, if we defined X2 as a relative coordinate, what happens to H? How will it look like? Think about it. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye-bye.